Well, hello everyone. This is Mr. Reeves again, and we are continuing to work our way through the grade seven CASP math practice test. And we were supposed to be starting with question number 17 until I realized that I failed to do number 16 in the last video. So we're going to have to do six problems this time around because last time we only did four. So here we go. Question number 16. Lisa wrote the expression quantity of 3 plus 6x minus 2 times the quantity of x plus 1 plus 5. She simplified the expression using the following steps, and then it shows the steps. Lisa says that her original expression is equal to x plus 6, which she simplified it down to in step 4. And it says Lisa's statement is incorrect. Therefore, the statement is not true. So somewhere along the line here, she made a mistake. So these actually are not equal, even though Lisa said that they are. So the question is, where did she make her mistake? All right. So if we take a look at this original expression, if you take the original expression and you compare it to what she has in step one, you'll see from here on over, it's exactly the same. So nothing changed, nothing changed from there to there. So what did change? She took this expression right here, 3 plus 6x, and she changed it to 3 times 1 plus x. So what she is saying is she is saying that the quantity 3 plus 6x is equal to 3, sorry, the expression 3 plus 6x is equal to 3 times the quantity of 1 plus x. All right, so let's examine that and see if that actually is true. Um, now, you should be familiar with the distributive property. The distributive property says if you have a constant that is being multiplied by a quantity, and inside that quantity, the terms are separated by addition, and this also works for subtraction, that you can multiply by this constant out there. So A times the quantity of B plus C is equal to AB plus AC. And that is because of the distributive property. And you can go the other direction as well. If I started with AB plus AC, and I wanted to say, okay, I want to go the opposite direction that I went before, I can say, well, this expression right here has a common factor of A. And I'm going to factor out that A and I get A times B plus C. And we call that process factoring. So the distributive property is when you multiply to get the expression, which then becomes two terms separated by addition. When we start with the two terms separated by addition and end up back with the multiplication by a quantity, that process is called factoring. So if you look at what Lisa did, she started off with the two terms being added and ended up with the constant multiplied by the quantity. So what she did was she actually did factoring. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite 3 plus 6x as 3 plus 3 times. Now I'm going to ask you, if I take 6x and I divide out the factor of 3, what is 6x divided by 3? Well, 6 divided by 3 is 2. So 6x divided by 3 is 2x. So if you factor then out the 3 out of this, what do you get? You get 3 times 1 plus 2x. Now if we bring down what she said it was, she said it was 3 times 1 plus x. So do you see the mistake? There should be a 2 here, and she only had a 1 there. 
So her mistake actually was made in that first step right there. The, cor the rest is actually correct. If you do 3x plus 1s minus 2x plus 1s, you actually get 1x plus 1 right there. And then if you take those parentheses away because everything's addition, 1 plus 5 actually does equal 6. But because she made that mistake in the first step, then everything else from there falls apart. So I'd already marked it. The correct answer for number 16 is A, step number one. And now we're ready to start where we were supposed to start, which was on question number 17. The graph shows a proportional relationship between the number of hours a factory is in operation and the number of gallons of water used. All right, so I believe we've done proportional relationships on at least two previous problems, but we'll keep bringing ourselves back and reminding us, reminding ourselves what that means. So right here, hours of operation, that's our x-axis. Right here, number of gallons used, that is our y-axis. And in a proportional relationship, In a proportional relationship, we know a few things. We know that there is a constant of proportionality, which we call K, which can be found by doing Y divided by X. K is Y divided by X, and we know you can rewrite that as Y equals KX. And this right here would be the equation of the line. So if this is a proportional relationship, and they said it is, then the equation of this line right here is going to be y equals kx. And if we want to know what k is, we need to take any y and divide it by x. So we can go anywhere here, and we could put a point right here. And if I were to ask you what is that point, well, the x value is 2, and the y value is 2,000. So if I were to find k for that point, I would do 2,000 divided by 2, and I would get 1,000, right? All right, so what about if I did this point right here? That point right there is 4, 4,000. So once again, if I were to find the value of k from that point, I would do 4,000 divided by 4, and guess what I would get? 1,000. In a proportional relationship, it does not matter which point you pick, including that point w. That y divided by x will always be k. That's why it's called a constant. k is the constant of proportionality. The constant of proportionality. So k for this case is a thousand, so the equation of this line is going to be y equals 1000 x. k equals 1000. All right, so I haven't even read what they're asking me yet, but all of that information uh, we all know is correct, and so that should help us now know whether each of these statements is a true statement or whether each of these statements is a false statement. Here we go. Number one, the factory uses four gallons of water when it is in operation for 4,000 hours. All right, so remember, hours of operation is X and gallons is Y. I think we got this backwards, don't we? All right, this graph down here, hours, there's four hours, but it's talking about 4,000 hours. That would be way, way, way over here, right? 4,000 hours, and that line would go way, 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 way up high, right? Do you see what they did here? They switched it, all right? The factory uses 4,000 gallons of water for four hours, so this is a false statement. Again, they switched these two. 
All right, point W represents the number of gallons water, gallon, excuse me, let me try that again. Point W represents the number of gallons of water used when the factory is in operation for seven hours. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look right here. If I go straight down from W, there's seven hours, right? And if I go straight over, do you know where I should end up with? If we do our relationship of the number of gallons being a thousand times the number of hours, this should be what right here? 7,000. So this point is 7, 7,000. So point W represents the number of gallons used. Well, point W actually represents two things. It represents on the Y part the number of gallons used for seven hours. But I'm assuming they want us to say true to this one, though I don't really like how they phrase that. All right, so they really should have said the Y value of point W, but they didn't. All right, so the factory uses 9,000 gallons of water when it is in operation for nine hours. So again, right here, nine hours would be our X, 9,000 would be our Y, and that actually does make this equation true, right? If I put in nine there, I'm going to get 9,000 there. So this one is also true. Still a little bit. Bit. Hmm, that one's bugging me a little bit. But, all right, here we go. So we're going to say false, true, true. And that knocks out question number 17. Here we go. 18, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, this one looks fun. All right, the figure shown is created by joining two rectangles. All right, so I am thinking here that the two rectangles they're talking about are this bottom rectangle, and if I extend this side all the way across, right? So this is my bottom rectangle here. It's 15 by 75, and my top rectangle here is, oh, it doesn't want to erase. Oh, it went away. Okay, my top rectangle is 10 by 25. Enter the area in square inches of the figure. All right, so do you guys know what the formula for the area of a square is? Well, the area of a square is not what we're looking for. We're looking for the area of a rectangle. A square, by the way, is a rectangle, but it is a special case of a rectangle where all the sides are the same or they are congruent. But we're looking for any old rectangle and the area of any old rectangle is the length times the width. The length times the width. So if we take a look at this bottom rectangle, we're going to let L equal 75 and we're going to let W equal 15. So the area of this bottom rectangle is going to be 75 times 15. And the top rectangle is 25 by 10. So the entire, entire figure, right? The area of the entire figure is going to be those two added together. 75 times 15 plus 25 times 10. That's going to be the total area of this figure. All right, and we could do this by hand, I hope. 25 times 10, you immediately know that is 250. 75 times 15 might not jump into your head as quickly. And I'm seeing over here, once again, we have the use of the calculator. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring up that calculator and we're gonna do 75 times 15 plus 25 times 10. All right, so here we go. Here we go. So we're going to do 75 times 15 plus 25 times 10. And just a reminder, the calculator is smart enough to know order of operations. So it's going to do 75 times 15 
and then it's going to do 25 times 10. And then after doing that, it's going to add those together because according to PEMDAS, according to the correct order of operations, multiplication comes before addition. And when it does that in correct order of operations, it gets 1,375. So the correct answer is 1,300. And 75, and it actually would be square inches, 1,375 square inches. The units actually are in the question, so we don't actually have to put the units in our answer. So if you were writing this answer out, it would be important that you put the units. Area is always in square units, but since they put the units in the question, all you have to give is the numeric part of the answer. And so we're going to get one three. Sorry, what was it? It was one three seven five. One thousand three hundred and seventy five. One three seven five. And on to question number 19. All right, my good buddy Alfonso went to Famous Sam's appliance store and purchased a refrigerator and a stove. The sale price of the refrigerator was 40% off the original price, and the sale price of the stove was 20% off the original price. Which statement must be true to conclude that Alfonso received a 30% overall discount on the refrigerator and the stove together? Wow. This is a tricky question. All right, so let's go ahead and think about this before we go down and look at these specifics. All right, so you might say, okay, well, 40% off of one and 20% off of another. You might think he saved 60%. All right, so, but that couldn't make sense, right? Because you can't save more percent combined than you do on either one, right? If I save 40% off, I didn't save 60% off. So if we want to know the combined percent off, it's not going to be 60% by adding them together. So then, oh, well, how about if we average them, right? 40% plus 20%. Well, that's going to make 60%, right? But that was on two items, so then we divide it by two. And it's 30%. So that makes sense, right? Saving 30% off. All right. But notice it says 30% overall discount on the refrigerator and the stove together. So does saving 40% off of one item and 20% off of a different item mean that you saved 30% off combined? Hmm. All right. Let's just pretend, we're going to pretend, okay, well, this is not actual numbers, we're going to pretend the, the refrigerator cost $1,000, okay, and we're going to pretend the stove cost $100, all right, so if the refrigerator cost $1,000 and he got 40% off, 40% of 100 would be 40, so 40% 40 of 1,000 would be 400. So he saved $400. All right. And then on the stove, he is saving what percent? He's saving 20% off the stove. Well, 20% of 100 is 20. So here he saved $20. So combined, how much did he save? So combined, he saved $420. Now the question is, is, I'm going to write it over here, is $420 30% of 
of the total. Well, what was the original, right? The total was a thousand plus a hundred. Sorry. I really should say of the original, right? Of the original total? Are the original combined, right? So, is 420 30% of $1,100? Well, let's go ahead right here, and I'm going to put in 30%. So, 0 0.30 is 30% of $1,100. Whoops, that is a mistake here. Let's go back, $1,100. So if we added the two together and then took 30%, what would we get? What would we get? We would get $330. So $330 is 30% of $1,100. So if Alfonso saved 30%, then he should have saved $330. But how much did he actually save? He actually saved what? $420. So he did not save 30% of the combined purchase. He actually saved more than 30% of the combined purchase. Well, why is that? Because the, the larger discount was on a much larger amount, and the smaller discount was on a much smaller amount. 40% of a thousand is very different than 40% of a hundred. And 20% of a hundred is very different than 20% of a thousand. If I switch these numbers around and had him save 20% on the refrigerator and 40% on the stove, then he would have actually saved much less than 30%. So how could we guarantee that saving 40% and then saving 20% would actually eventually equal saving 30%? Only if what? Only if these two things were the same, which they are not. Since they are not the same, since they are not the same, saving 40% on one thing and 20% on something else, is not, is not, is not the same as saving 35, 30% overall, okay? So, which statement must be true? The sale price of the refrigerator and the stove were the same? Is it the sale price that we want to be the same? Or is it the original price? That's what we're looking for right there. We want the original price of the refrigerator and the stove to be the same. And then saving 40% and saving 20% would be the same as saving 30%. Because if I change that 100 to 1,000, then 30% of that would be 300. And then we would get $700, right? We would have saved 400 and 300. And if you do a thousand, if you were to do two thousand, take away seven hundred, you would get that thirty percent save. All right, there we go. Oh, so the original price of the refrigerator and the stove were the same is the answer that we were looking for. All right, question number twenty. Select all the tables that represent a proportional relationship between X and Y. We just cannot get away from these proportional. Uh, relationship questions, can we? So once again, rewind the video if you need to. K, the constant of proportionality, is equal to Y divided by X. 
So y divided by x must be a constant if proportional. Y divided by x must be a constant if the relationship is proportional. All right, and it says select all, and these are squares, not circles, which implies that we can choose more than one. We don't have to, but more than likely, usually these type of questions are going to have more than one correct answer. All right, so let's start at the bottom and work our way up because these are fractions and these aren't. So we'll start with the easier ones. Okay, so this is our y and this is our x. So what do I get if I do 5 divided by 1? What do I get? I get 5. What do I get if I do 15 divided by 3? I get 5. And what do I get if I do 20 divided by 4? That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I get 5. So guess what? This is a proportional relationship, right? All righty. By the way, we don't do the zeros. You notice every single one of these goes through zero, zero. And that seems to be something that my students grab onto with proportional relationships, that it has to go through zero, zero, and all of these do. But that doesn't necessarily make it proportional. It doesn't alone. It's not sufficient, we say, to make it proportional. But we don't do zero divided by zero because zero divided by zero is undefined. So when you are checking for a proportional relationship, check the points that are not zero, zero. All right, so if we were to look at this one, I hope you can quickly see that it's not going to work. One divided by one is one. Nine divided by three is three. And 25 divided by five is five. And 1 does not equal 3, and 3 does not equal 5. So this one is not proportional. No, it is not proportional. Oh my goodness, fractions. 1 third divided by 1 half, 1 fourth divided by 1 third, and 1 fifth divided by 1 fourth. So, how's your fraction division? One third divided by one half. You remember, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Or keep, change, flip, or keep, switch, flip. A lot of you learn from your teachers. All right, and then what do we get? We get multiplying straight across two over three. If we did the next one, so that one right there equal two over three. If I then do one fourth divided by one third, so now I'm doing this one right here, one fourth divided by one third, that's the same as one fourth times three over one. And when I multiply straight across now, I get three fourths. Does two thirds equal three fourths? Those are not the same. Uh, so we don't even actually have to check the last one. Uh, we will just because, you know, math is so much fun. One-fifth divided by, whoops, sorry. One-fifth divided by one-fourth is going to be the same as one-fifth times four over one. Now multiplying straight across, we get four-fifths. And four-fifths does not equal two-thirds, and it does not equal. Three, four. So this one is also no. So what are you thinking about the first one? You thinking it's going to be yes? All right, I'm thinking that as well. All right, but let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Once again, we want to divide. All right, so before we do that, just take a look real quick. If you look at this one to that one, what do you notice? The top numbers are the same, and the bottom number is what? Times 2. The top numbers are the same, and the bottom number is times 2. The top numbers are the same, and the bottom number is times 2. So what do you multiply? Remember we talked about how y is equal to k times x? 
So what do you multiply by to make the top number stay the same and the bottom number be twice as big? Well, what do you multiply by to, to make the top number the same? That would be one, right? And what do you multiply by to make the bottom number twice as big? That would be two. So k is equal to one half. So each of these fractions is half of each of these fractions. So the answer on this one is going to be yes. Now, if you didn't pick that up, you could do the same process dividing here. And I do want you to notice that they did give us a calculator. And if you're not super duper good with dividing fractions, I was going to see right here we have a fraction bar, right? So if we wanted to do a fraction division problem, uh, we could. We could do 1 over 10. And then I'm going to click to the side here, and I'm going to go divided by. And you notice it put it on the bottom. Divided by, and then I'm going to put the fraction again, 1 divided by 5. And when I do that, I get 0 0.5, or 1 half, right? So that divided by that was one half. If I change this one to a two, right? And I change this one to a two. So now I'm doing two tenths divided by two fifths. Guess what? It's still a half. And finally, the last one, if I did three tenths divided by Three fifths. By the way, you know it's not just staying on the same thing because at, when I change that one, that changed right there. But when I change this to three, it goes back to a half. So you can use the calculator. You're welcome to use the calculator if it's there. Um, I encourage you to do as much math as you can without a calculator, but checking it with a calculator or using the calculator when you don't know how to do it otherwise is a smart idea. So we went with the first one. And the last one as being yes, and the middle two as being no. All right, two questions to go, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. The circumference of a circle is 37.7 centimeters, approximately. Approximately, and we know it can only be approximate because it's going to involve pi. But we'll talk about that in just a second. It says, enter the radius of the circle in centimeters. Round your answer to the nearest whole number. Guys, when you're reading these questions, be very careful. Whole numbers. What are whole numbers? Whole numbers start at zero and then go one, two, three, four, five. They don't want any decimals. They don't want any fractions. All right? So we got to keep that in mind. When we go to put an answer in, it's either going to be 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or any other whole number. No decimals, no fractions. All right. So hmm, what do we know about circumference? All right. So when we have a circle, we there's a couple formulas that we should know with circles. I'm going to start with area because it's not the one in the problem. The area of a circle four circles here just to remind us that that's what we're working with. The area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. Pi times the radius squared. The circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter, or we often say two times pi times the radius, because the diameter of a circle is twice the radius. The diameter of a circle is twice the radius. Let's see if I can make a circle real quickly here. All right, so there's my circle. This point right here is the center of the, the circle. So if I make a segment from the center to any point on the circle, we call that the radius. If I make a different segment that goes completely across the circle through the center, we call that the diameter. But the diameter is simply made up of two radii, right? Because that length is a radius, that length is a radius. So D is equal to 
to R. So right here we are replacing the D with 2 times R. But because 2 is a coefficient, we put it in front. So instead of saying pi times 2R, we move the 2 up to the front and we say 2 pi R. So that right there is the formula for the circumference, circumference, I think I spelled that correct. All right, so two times pi times the radius equals 37.7 centimeters. And what are they asking us to find? It says enter the what? The radius. They want us to find that right there. All right, so hopefully you remember when we're solving equations, if I gave you 2x equaled 37.7, and I asked you to find out what x was, what would you do? Hopefully you would know to divide by 2, right? So if I gave you 2 times pi times x equals 37.7, and I asked you to find that same x, you could simply divide by 2 pi. Pi is nothing more than a number. It's a very long number. In fact, it goes on forever. It's an irrational number. But if, but if I have 2 times x and I divide by 2, if I have 2 pi times x, I divide by 2 pi. So we're not trying to find x. We're trying to find r. So right here, what am I going to do? I'm going to divide both sides by 2 pi, all right? So r is equal to 37.7 divided by 2 pi. And I notice I have a calculator here. Now, many times when you're doing these problems, they say to approximate, they often say to use 3.14 for pi. So be careful when you're doing these problems. Do they tell you to approximate pi? Well, pi doesn't equal 3.14. Pi is an irrational number that goes on forever. And unless I'm missing it, I'm not seeing anything on here that tells me to approximate pi. So I'm sure hoping that this calculator has a pi button on it um, because otherwise then I'm gonna have to go ahead and approximate pi because I haven't memorized what pi equals, to be honest with you. All right, so we want to do 37.7 divided by 2 times pi. All right, so let's cross our fingers and pull up the calculator. All right, so I'm scanning real quickly here, and there it is. Cool, there's pi, so we're good. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in as a fraction. If you remember what we had at the beginning, it was 37.7, and on the bottom, I'm going to put 2 times pi. 2 times pi. So 37.7 divided by 2 pi, here's my answer right here, 6.00014135 and it would keep going on forever and ever and ever and ever. But you remember what the problem asked us to do? They asked us to find the nearest whole number. Well, what's the nearest whole number to 6.00014135? You got it. Six. So the answer we are looking for is six. And by the way, if you wanted to do a quick check, right, do you remember what we said circumference is? Circumference is two times pi times the radius. And we just approximated the radius as six. So if I go up to my handy dandy calculator, let me clear it all out. And if I go two times pi, right, times 6, I get 37 point, what, 699, which is really, really, really close to 37.7. All right, so again, guys, use these calculators wisely, both to do the work and to check your work when you're done. All right, that's question 21. We got one to go. Question 22. Oh, I'm liking this. All right. 
drag the correct arrow onto the number line to represent the solution of the inequality 6x minus 4 is less than 8. So just a reminder right here, that symbol right there means is less than or is smaller than. So what are we trying to do? We have the expression 6x minus 4 and we have the constant 8. And what do we want to know? I want to know for what values of x is 6x minus 4 less than 8. Well, again, this is called an inequality because it has this inequality sign right here. Let's pretend a minute that it were an equation. If I had 6x minus 4 equaled 8, this would be a two step equation. And remember, when you are solving an equation, the goal is to find the value of x that makes the equation true. And we do that by isolating the variable using inverse operations, using inverse operations. So I'm going to work towards getting that x by itself. And remember, when we're working backwards, we don't use order of operations, we use order of operations in reverse. Going forwards, if I knew what x was, I would multiply by 6 and then subtract 4. So if I'm going backwards, I need to eliminate this minus 4 first and then eliminate the 6. So what is the opposite or the inverse of subtracting 4? It's adding 4. And when I add 4 to both sides, because when you solve an equation, you do everything to both sides, I get 6x equals 12. And that 6 times x, what is the inverse or the opposite of multiplying by 6? It's dividing by 6. And then what do I get? I get x is equal to 2. So if I put 2 in there, 6 times 2 minus 4 equals 8. 12 minus 4 equals 8. 8 equals 8. So 2 is the value that makes this expression equal 8. So if I put a 2, if I put a point on the number line right there, then 6x minus 4 would equal 8 right here, right? But we actually don't want it to be equal. We want to find the values that are less than that. So let me ask you a question. If I go over here, how do these numbers compare to 2? Well, what are they? They are what? They're larger, right? So if I were to pick 3, say, or 4, or 5, or 10 even, let's try 10. Do you agree 10 would be over here? 10 would be somewhere way over here. 6 times 10 is 60. 60 minus 4 is 56. Do you agree that is not going to be smaller? Anything larger is going to make this larger but we want it to be what? Smaller, correct? Anything smaller is going to make it smaller. So for example, if I put in zero, zero is smaller than two. Six times zero is zero. Zero minus four is negative four. So what do we want? We want these ones that are smaller, but do we want two? Do we want 2 to be part of our answer? 2, going back again, makes it what? Equal. If this had that under it, if it had that symbol, then it would be less than or equal to. But it doesn't have that symbol. So it doesn't want it to be less than or equal to, only less than. So that means I want this to be an open circle. And then what do I want? Then I want an arrow that goes this way, because over here are the values that are gonna make it smaller. So everything smaller or everything less than two. So that's what we're looking for. So which of these do we want? We want this one right here. So it says to grab the correct one, and that's where we want it. We want it right there. Did I get it right? All right, looks like that's what we're looking for. Did my best there. All right, drag the correct arrow onto the number line. 
I got it certainly as close as I possibly can. Hopefully they're a little bit forgiving that it's not quite perfect. Arrow pointing to the left on the number line. All right, I believe I finished on the right problem this time. Next time we will pick up at number 23. Thanks for watching everybody, hope this helped.